a lot of people have ignored the command to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, cleanse lepers, until there's a family crisis, and then they try to learn how to get a healing anointing. Things are difficult to learn in crisis. It's difficult to learn how to minister healing to the sick when it's your loved one. There's many strikes against you. I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying it's, it's the most difficult context in which to learn what Jesus commanded us to do before we ever had a crisis. <clears throat> the best way to prepare yourself to operate in a gift of faith is to already operate in the abiding faith. The abiding faith has an overall approach to life that draws from the goodness of God and knows everything works for his good. Carrying that attitude, it's not just a psychological attitude, it's not just being positive, it certainly includes that, but it's carrying that overall approach to life that everything works for good. Even the worst thing, God is prepared to reverse its effect so that tragedy becomes triumph. That abiding faith is what positions us for what we need in crisis, the gift of faith. It's difficult to move from ground zero to extraordinary faith. What I'm trying to say is that, <clears throat> is that we, we get real serious about breakthrough and the anointing for breakthrough and the extraordinary miracle when we face family crisis or perhaps you're a loved one or a very close friend is in crisis. And it's okay to learn to do that, but Jesus didn't fast for a miracle. He fasted into a lifestyle. <clears throat> he told the disciples when they, when they struck out and couldn't help the, the kid that was tormented, they came to him and says, how come, you know, everything we've tried in the past has worked, it didn't work this time, how come? Jesus said, this kind only comes out with prayer and fasting, and yet he neither prayed nor fasted because he had already prayed into a sustainable lifestyle. He already fasted, prayed his way into a sustainable lifestyle. So fasting wasn't necessary for him in the moment because he had come into an awareness of divine purpose, the will of God. Most of us know the will of God on an intellectual level. We know that he wants everybody healed, but we, not from an abiding level, not from a place of conviction. Faith is the conviction of things hoped for. Abiding faith is to be that which burns in us. It's that overall awareness that nothing can come at me that God doesn't have a present day solution for. Caring that kind of abiding faith is what prepares me or positions me, I should say, for that faith that I need for something that is beyond what I have experienced so far. <clears throat> Does this make sense? Yeah. That, that, let's just put it in numbers uh, for, for money just because it's, it's so easy to measure. You start off, you know, with $10 faith, and through the years you build. And let's say that it's no problem at all for you to believe God for $1,000. Provision, a miracle of provision for $1,000, because you've worked into that level. You, can, you have no problem at all, just something comes up, I know God's going to provide. But when you have a $20,000 bill that comes in unexpectedly, a crisis, something happened to the house, and you all of a sudden have a crisis then you can't operate out of that abiding faith that has worked itself like a muscle up to a level of strength. You now need something supernatural to invade where you are, and where you are is that place of abiding faith. The gift of faith is what gives you access to a realm greater than what you've worked into. Now, when you step into the gift of faith, you never return to where you were. You always return to a place a little greater than before, but not where you were in that moment. Sometimes we do the self-criticism thing because we can't sustain what we were capable of doing in the gift of faith. And it's that self-analysis that actually destroys our capacity to continue climbing in that lifestyle of faith. And so the Lord gives me an experience in the $20,000 faith. I don't return to the 1000 I return to maybe $1,500, if, if, you know, if, if that makes sense to you. It's like, it's like the experience has, has given me a strength 
The experience that I got is just a gift. It came out of nowhere. I don't know how it came. I don't know how I got it. But I was positioned for it because I carried the overall attitude of the conviction of God's goodness that I know nothing can come at me, that he won't work for his good and for his purposes, which implies that not everything that comes at me is his will because he has to rework it. Not everything that comes at us is God's will. We have confusion. One of our biggest areas of confusion in the church is concerning the sovereignty of God. We know that God is all-powerful. We know that, that he is in charge of everything. But with that, we make a mistake in thinking he is in control of everything. There's a difference from being in charge and being in control. If you think he is in control of everything, then you have to believe that Hitler was his will, that he was just going to work it for his purposes. Why would God raise something up to be his will that he empowers you to pray against? You've got a split personality. You've got the father working against the son, the son working against the father. So you have to understand that God has created a system where humanity gets to live, and through partnership, we get to demonstrate and manifest the dominion of God in the earth. He comes at our invitation because he has released the dominion to us. That's why prayer is so essential. Many of the great saints in history believe that God's hands were so-called handcuffed, but released through prayer, was released into the situation through the partnership with delegated authority on planet Earth, giving him permission to come. Now, he's God of everything. He's ruler of everything. He can step onto the stage anytime he wants. But as C.S. Lewis put it, he says, when the author steps on the stage, the play is over. So if you want him to step on the stage, just realize the moment he does, it is over and everybody's choice ends where it is. And so if you believe that God is in control of everything, then you have to look at crisis and tragedy and say, well, he allowed it for for a purpose. No, he didn't allow it for a purpose. He put us in in a realm where our authority, our will has an effect on what happens around us. It doesn't mean we walk in guilt and shame for tragedy, but it does mean we take ownership of responsibility on the earth. You know, the question I ask people often, I said, how many storms did Jesus bless? How many life-threatening storms did he bless? How many, how many of those storms did he redirect and say, now go destroy that city? It'll humble them and it'll teach them to pray. They'll become more like me. That's the church's response to crisis. Is that, well, God worked it for good. Well, he can use anything for good. That's, the, that's our ace in the hole, so to speak. I mean, that's the trump card. It's, anything that happens, he can turn around for good. But it doesn't mean it was his will or his purpose. So if the Lord approves everything, then it's really difficult to believe him to change it. There's an idea that God creates a problem so that he can fix it to show so strong he is. Listen, he's not an egomaniac. So if God didn't orchestrate the storm, why did it happen? My question is, who did he leave in charge? Who did he give his name to? Who did he give his authority to? Who did he give a model for, an example to follow? He gave us written in Scripture how the Son of God lives, and he said, as the Father sent me, I send you. 